Good morning to all our viewers. Welcome back again to this uh, fifth session in our webinar series, webinar series that has been organized by Kia Mangalam University with distinguished scholars, academicians, and industry leaders. For those of you who are joining for the first time and are from other institutions and schools, my name is Aditya Malik, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Kia Mangalam University. Today, it's a delight and a pleasure for me to introduce the speaker for today, Professor Sumanyu Satpati. Professor Satpati is currently Professor of Eminence at Kia Mangalam University. He is former professor and head of Department of English at the University of Delhi. He was also a fellow at the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies at, Sim at Shimla. As a visiting professor, he has taught at the University of Granada in Spain, Frankfurt University in Germany, Exeter University in England, among several others. His areas of specialization include modernism, queer theory, digital, hum digital humanities, and Odisha studies. Among his most recent publications are Will to Argue, Studies in Late Colonial and Post-Colonial Controversies, Primus, 2017, and Southern Postcolonialisms, the Global South, and the New Literary Representations, Routledge, 2009. Professor Satpati is also spearheading our new and more exciting program in digital humanities. He's been at the forefront of preparing these programs and also teaching the courses in digital humanities at Kia Mangalam University. It's indeed a pleasure to have you here today with us. The topic of Professor Satpati's talk is Postcolonial Theory Now, an introduction for undergraduate students. I now hand it over to Professor Satpati. Thank you, Professor Malik. Uh, very good morning to our viewer. I'm great to start it, Malik and uh, KR Mangalam University in general, uh, Professor Malik in particular, for inviting me to ease. I congratulate uh, the university for the great initiatives, this great initiative to ensure that the show must go on and the faculty and students are kept fruitfully preoccupied. I thank uh, um, uh, Professor Anita Sharma, the Pro Vice Chancellor. I also uh, thank my young colleagues, Kanu Priya and Molly for goading me into this particular uh, conversation with a wider public at a time when we are all uh, locked down and confined to our <clears throat> isolated uh, chambers, except for the books to keep us company. Um, right at the beginning, um, I'll begin with a, a caveat, which is that uh, in comparison with the other webinars that we have had, you know, over the last three uh, webinars, um, they were all on broad-based topics. Mine seems to be, you know, at least from the title, a bit uh, too narrowly disciplinary centric, discipline centric, that is English studies. But to allay your fears, I'm assuming that we have a uh, diversity of audience across different disciplines. To allay your fears, I'd like to say that uh, this particular topic is not limited to though it has been by and large monopolized by English studies in the humanities departments. It cuts across many disciplines. And as I uh, go on and uh, talk about, you know, this particular subject, post-colonial uh, studies, uh, post-colonial theory now, uh, it would be apparent, it will be very clear that you know it, and i will try to uh, delimit the subject and uh, ensure that uh, we go uh, beyond uh, mere literary studies uh, as you can see uh, looking at the title uh, you know post colonial theory now the emphasis is on now because post colonial uh, theory as we know it uh, has evolved over the last 40 years. So what is it like now? How was it at the beginning? So this particular uh, lecture would be more uh, broad-based, uh, broad, you know, kind of overview 
rather than uh, you know going deep into the subject uh, to begin with uh, let me say that it's almost 40 years old when uh, since uh, what we later recognized as subaltern studies or post colonial studies post colonial theory is at least 40 years old and you know the uh, you know I'll, I'll just go into a bit of a history of uh, this particular field of study before i come to the subject proper um you know the 1980s seem to be a watershed decade 1980s in so far as post colonial theory is concerned uh, why do I call it a water set? Um, it's partly because, you know, this is the time when uh, several groups of uh, academic scholars, uh, University of Sussex and elsewhere, they started individually and in groups to talk about uh, a different approach to uh, the discourse of colonialism. Um, the first name that comes to our mind is, uh, you know, the subaltern group uh, led by uh, Ranajit Guha. Ranajit Guha, of course, had done his work in the late 1960s, 70s, but by the 90, it was by the 1980s that some sort of a group came under, and there were several, a couple of volumes, edited volumes, uh, which came under the broad rubric of subaltern studies that inaugurated this particular discipline. Uh, 1980s is also the time, 1982 to be specific, when Salman Rushdie uh, talks about the empire writing back, W-R-I-T-I-N, the empire writing back, uh, taking on from the title of a film in the Star Wars series called The Empire Strikes Back from the Star Wars series that um, many of us would recall. Um, I think the, the, the students, the millennials may not be very familiar with the uh, subject, but thanks to Netflix and the TV uh, and the internet, many of you have uh, must have got some idea about what the Star Wars series was like. And one of the, I think it was the second in the series, which was called The Empire Strikes Back. Salman Dusdi, who had uh, just published his um, very important work, uh, Midnight's Children, uh, uses this particular uh, term, the title, and uh, um, you know, rephrase it, calling it the Empire Rights Back. What does he mean by it? I'll come to it very soon, very shortly. But uh, before that, I want to also mention another book of the same title about seven years later, I think it was about uh, 1988, 89, that uh, volume edited by Bill Ashcroft and his colleagues. I jokingly called them Tiffin, Muffin and so on, but there was one uh, editor who was also <laughs> Tiffin. Uh, so there are two other co two or three other co-editors of uh, Bill Ashcroft who uh, came up with this volume, edited volume called The Empire Rights Back, borrowing the title from what Salman Rushdie had said. So then there are three, um, you know, names I have already articulated. One is the subaltern group. The other one is uh, the title of uh, uh, lecture by and essay by Salman Rushdie called "The Empire Rights Back," and a book. I think it was a very influential book, "The Empire Rights Back," which is um, derived from Salman Rushdie's title. So uh, we can say safely that uh, you know the discipline or the field of study that we call post-colonial theory was inaugurated in the 1980s. But like uh, most other um, important, uh, most other important movements, this movement, academic movement called post-colonial uh, theory or studies. Uh, had its antecedents. So what, what I'll do is I'll go back in time a little bit. The most important work which preceded these discourses that we are talking about in the 1980s is 
uh, a very important book called Orientalism by uh, Edward Said. Uh, many people have paid tribute to Said's work, uh, you know, some of the best or the uh, most important post-colonial theorists we uh, read these days, whether it's Gayatri Spivak or uh, Parth Chatterjee uh, and several others who have uh, talked about what an impact Said's Orientalism had on them and how their intellectual, uh, intellectual orientation uh, changed after reading Orientalism. I'm punning on the word <laughs> Orientalism, you know, how their uh, intellectual frame, uh, you know, intellectual approach was uh, reoriented after uh, reading uh, Edward Said's Orientalism. Now, what is uh, I'll come back again to Orientalism, just as I shall come back to post uh, uh, subaltern studies. Uh, this was published in 1978, a few years before um, these three landmarks I mentioned in uh, the 1980s. So 1978, Orientalism. Then we go back further, back in time, uh, uh, to a uh, very great uh, Martinique writer, Francophone writer. Uh, uh, Martinique, as you might know, is uh, it continues to be a colony. It's uh, located somewhere in the Caribbean islands, a French colony. And uh, a, a psychiatrist called French, French Fanon wrote two very important books. And uh, he influenced not only uh, thinkers in South Asia, but he also and primarily influenced the thinkers of, uh, you know, the black intellectuals, writers, through his work. Uh, two major works, Wretched, The Wretched of the Earth, and the second one is called Black Skin, White Mask. These were published in the 1950s and 60s, if I remember correctly. You know, I don't remember the exact dates, but these two works are very important. He was a psychiatrist, but uh, he, he, his, uh, his work, The Wretched of the Earth, and particularly Black Skin, White Mask, uh, is a bit autobiographical. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an analytical work, but it is also, uh, it depends on uh, the experiential framework of the author, you know, what all things he underwent as a uh, colonial. This is very important uh, uh, landmark. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the history of uh, uh, post-colonial uh, studies and uh, um, certainly subaltern studies. Uh, uh, French Fanon, then. Uh, 1952 is the date, if I remember correctly, for Black Skin, White Mask. I'll again come back to what Fanon does here. But I'll take you back further to 1909. 1909, is the year in which Gandhi, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, published his very important book. He had not yet come to India. He had not started, uh, you know, though he had come around the turn of the century to India to take part in the um, Swadeshi movement. He was turned back by the leaders of the movement in those days, the Lal and uh, Pal, you know, Bipin, Bipin Chandra Pal. Uh, all these people, you know, they, one of them actually, I don't, again, I forget, he was, Gandhi was turned back. He said, it's too early for you to come here. So, when on board a ship from England to South Africa, uh, the second time he went back to South Africa, Gandhi wrote this very important book, Hind Swaraj. Now, <coughs> Hind Swaraj is in the form of a dialogue between the editor and uh, the interlocutor. And this is about what colonialism has done to us and uh, what, how as colonials, how are we going to react? Um, you know, we might recall that 1905 is, the, is, a, is a very important landmark in the history of India's freedom movement. This is when uh, the partition of Bengal happened. And the Swadeshi movement of, uh, you know, several years, you know, where 
the freedom fighters were divided into two camps, the, the extremists and the moderates. Gandhi uh, knew about what was going on and he was thinking about what was the best way of coping with this um, anti-colonial sentiments. Now, one of the things he says in the book, which is very important, it's very difficult to summarize the whole book, but it's about uh, how to shun Western form of civilization. You know, it was a kind of nativism, but not entirely nativistic, not narrowly nativistic. Mahatma Gandhi was also very critical of uh, certain aspects of Indian tradition. And uh, Ashish Nandi talks about, uh, you know, critical, um, critical um, orthodoxy, that is some of the, some critical traditionalism, you know, Gandhi's form of resistance. Uh, it was not only a form of resistance to Western European discourses, but it was also a resistance, a revisionist approach to India's own condition. What, one of the things is that, you know, he, he said this very clearly, that what we want is the English ways, the European ways, without the Europeans, without the Englishmen. So we want to do the very things that we are supposed to be resisting. So, we, you know, um, he was more in favor of, uh, yeah, he, he was against industrialism. As you might know, he was against even installation of a telephone for many decades in his ashram, for many years in his ashram. Then finally, he accepted uh, the telephone. So his attitude towards uh, uh, modernity and tradition uh, was very complex. And uh, this is not the time to go into it. All that I want to say here is that it was a very, very important moment in the history of what we later on, the intellectual history of uh, post-colonial theory. So 1909, then 1952, French Fanon. French Fanon, the psychiatrist, again, I'll come back to French Fanon. What he's saying is that it is through language that we have been colonized. We have been uh, told, uh, you know, the colonial discourse about blackness being bad and evil, you know, the binary um, black and white and how the blacks are inferior and everything about them is inferior. So all that they need to do is to embrace. The way colonization happened was through this kind of discourse, the, the binaries that uh, were established by the colonial powers. Uh, powers. Uh, you know, it is not merely, sorry. Um, so uh, what the, you know, uh, as I said uh, right at the beginning when I mentioned black skin, white mask, it was somewhat autobiographical where he talks about how when he uses English, not quote unquote proper correct English, but Creole, he was criticized. He was expected to talk exactly like an English man or a, f a white man, uh, not English, French, pure, not a Creole. Um, idiom, but a pure French idiom. So he he registered that. He said, and though he personally registered it, he understood how uh, the the psychology of the colonized is uh, uh, is, is oriented in such a way that the the uh, colonized or uh, starts imitating or miming the colonizer. Uh, so that is what he is talking about. That it's a kind of mimicry. White, the skin is black. The mask is white. The black skin, white mask. That is the metaphor that he is using in the uh, title and throughout his book. He is talking basically about how the land of colonized people is taken away because it is said uh, in addition. Now I'll uh, go back to again um, after French Fanon. I'll go back to uh, the subaltern group. But uh, before that, um, I wanted to uh, talk about the Enlightenment project 
how at the root of colonization you have the enlightenment project around 1784 a german paper came up with the question uh, what is enlightenment what is enlightenment that is the question that was asked and uh, the famous uh, german philosopher immanuel kant uh, responded in the newspaper you know and this is his answer immanuel kant you remember the 18th century as being the age of uh, enlightenment, which is, um, you know, the framework of rationality, reason, uh, and uh, the whole ideology of progress, and so on and so forth. Now, then how, what, how does one define enlightenment? This was the question asked in the paper 1784, and Kant answers that question, and I quote his answer. Uh, he says, the enlightenment offer enlightenment offers mankind a way out of or exit from immaturity into the improved condition of maturity the enlightenment is the possibility whereby man philosophically acquires the status and capacities of a rational and adult being this is the answer and this is in english translation obviously it was in german uh, you can see how enlightenment is defined in terms of uh, adulthood. That anybody who is not enlightened is a child, is immature. And mankind can be mature, can be civilized only through enlightenment. Now, this was a very important, and when Kant was speaking like this, you know, one might ask, how is it that we isolate a single statement by one individual and they say this is what Europeans thought about us this is European discourse but the answer to that is that you know Kant is not one individual who uh, popped out of nowhere he is the product of an entire discourse so what he is saying maybe he is encapsulating or summing up what others thought but did not speak out and he is someone who is speaking out you know the thought for many others you know he is giving it some uh, words but it is crucial to note here that it's about maturity maturity childhood adult and so on and so forth and this is the discourse which goes into the making of what we call soon after the nation or ideas of nationalism how does a nation become mature? So the rise of nationalism, enlightenment, progress, all these ideas give rise to uh, uh, the, the various movements across Europe, uh, you know, nationalist movements. So uh, from the empire, from the Roman Empire, which disintegrates to the early 19th century when nationalism grows um, rather forcefully, and quite fast, and there's a, uh, lots of histories about uh, enlightenment project leading to nationalism in the 19th century, from 18th century to 19th century. So these, these, the idea of nationalism fuels the idea of stretching the boundaries of the nation. So empire building is an extension of the project of nationalism. This is a very important aspect of you know colonization. Of course, Lenin talks about it much later in around 1915 or 18 when he says that imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. But that comes much later. What is happening now is nationalism becomes uh, a concomitant of the Enlightenment project. Uh, of a certain kind which leads to empire building and so it's not a coincidence that um, at the height of nationalist movements across Europe you have you come up with many empires it's not that there were, there were trading companies there were trading companies before the 19th century but what is happening in the 19th century is the rapid colonization of large parts of uh, the world in Africa uh, and um, uh, 
south asia and so on and so in the far east so uh, what orientalism what uh, said does in orientalism is is talking about uh, how uh, this expansion empire building happens uh, much after the idea of the orient is constructed according to um, edward said now edward said you know 1978 he remind you of in your class this part of uh, post colonial theory but there are two tributes that said uh, pay is one is to gramsci the italian philosopher his notebooks uh, for the idea of hegemony and michel foucault very influential very important michel foucault whose uh, idea of discourse and the connect the, the relationship between uh, knowledge and power knowledge is constructed by discourse and the knowledge is something that leads to uh, power structures so these two thinkers you know gramsci and foucault influence edward said edward said was a uh, an academic english academic like us you know less a mortals but after being influenced by the work of gramsci on the idea of hegemony uh, i hope uh, you understand what hegemony means hegemony is uh, obtaining consent you know through obtaining consent through it's not so much through coercion it's not so much through aggression or violent warfare that uh, territories are occupied but it is through, through hegemony if you look at the british occupation from east india company to uh, the great uh, the raj 1857 the so called mutiny or the revolt you can see how uh, uh, much of the territory occupied is because of hegemony where um, apart from bringing in their own works see 1835 when macaulay is talking about uh, you know the importance of english education how already you have raja ramon rai uh, pleading for english education so anybody who was educated by then was thinking in terms of european discourse so uh, the colonized are colonized not through not so much through aggression or through violence or warfare as through the capturing of the mind so uh, discourse uh, of orientalism is something that also drives the colonizers even before they occupied much of the orient they already had constructed an orient you know through their imagination uh, much later uh, benedict anderson talks about the nation being an imagined uh, uh, the nation being imagined and uh, edward said is talking about the orient being imagined into being the orient was not something which is out there but it was constructed through discourse and hegemonizing followed this construction of the orient now if these are the ideas if these are the antecedent of post colonial studies if these are the antecedents of uh, subaltern studies which we uh, perforce call you know being um sister uh, 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 disciplines or rather uh, subaltern studies being part of uh, post colonial studies or post colonial theory subaltern studies now subaltern studies taking a cue from you know some of the um, ideas the history of ideas that i mentioned subaltern theories particularly ranajit guha in his work uh, in his many works talks about subaltern that history had been uh, written about uh, the elite you know the leaders the kings and the elite upper class and so on and so forth but surely um, anti colonial struggle doesn't happen only at the top level there are a large number of anonymous 
protagonist in this revolt, in the anti-colonial revolt, whose narratives must be uh, brought forth, uh, you know, whose narratives must be told. So they 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 talk they they give a new orientation to uh, historical studies. Uh, and who are the leaders apart from Ranajit Guha? You had Sumit Sarkar. Uh, and you had uh, Sahid Amin and, uh, uh, and uh, some of the acolytes of uh, Ranajit Guha, uh, Gyan Pandey, all these people, and I mean, uh, formerly my colleague at the University of Delhi, all these people uh, got together, not as in, you know, sitting there and writing, but they're all inspired by the idea of which they call subaltern studies. Subaltern is a term again coined by uh, Gramsci and subaltern is somebody who cannot, you know, it's, a, also, it's about a military rank, but it becomes a metaphor for the downtrodden. Uh, subaltern becomes a metaphor for the down, downtrodden, the un, unknown, unnamed, the unknown citizen, as it were. So, um, Subaltern studies uh, uh, take shape, and they are they they set up a counter discourse, you know, from the colonialist discourse, from the discourse of uh, the civilizing mission of the Europeans, the European Enlightenment project is sought to be registered. So Gandhi and uh, freedom fighters, of course, they had launched for decades. They launched uh, an active anti-colonial struggle through various means. It was the last 20, 25 years of the struggle before independence. It was non-cooperation, non-violence, and so on and so forth, led by Gandhi. But after independence, say 20 years after independence, the, the, the subaltern group and the other post-colonials, they started resisting the colonized mind to use the term, famous term, by an African writer, decolonizing the mind. So how does one decolonize the mind? It's about unlearning all the dominant discourses that had been taught. Now, it's a very interesting um, dilemma that people faced around this time. You know, we are all children of the Enlightenment or European discourse. How, how do we resist it? It's like sitting on top of the earth and using a lever to tilt the earth. It's not possible. You are sitting on it, edifice. So the edifice of our knowledge is the result of the Enlightenment project. And how do you uh, speak against it? This was a Herculean task. And therefore, uh, even though uh, successful, the critics, uh, many of the critics of uh, post-colonial theory and subaltern, uh, or the subaltern group, Mostly they are the Marxists like Isa Zahmad and several others. Therefore, that it's an impossible subject. And by so doing, we are killing Marxist ideas, Marxist thought, and the whole idea of revolution will now be defeated. So um, um, I wanted to go into the idea of uh, how uh, uh, how colonialist discourse uh, which is around nationalism to begin with anti-colonial struggle is also and it also gives rise to another kind of nationalism so that is the paradox that uh, many of the uh, post-colonial subjects had to confront how does um, anti-colonial struggle transcend the idea of the nation because it's the idea of the nation or nationalism in Europe which gave rise to these colonies or the big empires. Now, if we are struggling against these colonizers, are we not also giving rise to our own idea of our own nation? And this is where both Gandhi and Tagore had a problem with the freedom fighters. You will recall that Tagore is also talking about world literature. Uh, anyway, that's a different uh, a one kind of nationalism that 
Tagore is exploring in his novel Gore Baire and in many other novels, there are others as well. Gandhi is also a critique of uh, this kind of nationalism, which is part of our anti-national struggle. So these are some of the ideas of uh, post theory as it uh, there were many uh, critics of this. I've just mentioned Ahmad. I will not want to what happens to late 1990s. We gradually enter a globalized world. Now, as we enter a globalized world with globalization, where capital is no see nationalism is about national capital, wealth of nations. You know the famous title. But now, with globalization, capital is not limited to one nation state, or it is not. It doesn't have any borders. Capital travels. Uh, there was some resistance to um, globalization in the 1990s, late 1990s, early 90, uh, 2000. But it was almost inexorable. Every single world, including China, becomes part of you know a large globalized world. So post-colonial theory, which depended on the binary between the East and the West, the colonized and the colonizer, what does it do? One of the things that happens is that, you know, that kind of antagonism, there is a, a moment of reconciliation comes in. You will recall that Manmohan Singh, when he went to uh, England, uh, not so long ago, I think about 15 or 18 years ago, uh, he, has, he has been there many times. But what I have in mind is how he was very sympathetic towards the colonial project in India. He said, we have got many things, you know, there are many advantages that we, are, we have enjoyed following British colonialism in India. Uh, so there is an element of reconciliation that antagonism of uh, the early years of post-colonial theory has given way to uh, reconciliation following globalization. And even when globalization was seen as a new kind of colonization, new colonization, new imperialism, Americanization uh, or American imperialism, that has that gradually shifted to, uh, and there's a lot of migration happening. There's a lot of uh, uh, demographic changes happening. If uh, modernity is about, um, you know, demographic shifts from the country to the city, it's about, you know, that country is countryside or village. Now, globalization ensures that there is another kind of demographic shift, which is from country to country. So you have the diaspora. Now, what happens to then these uh, stiff binaries? In a way, post-colonial studies had inherited the binaries that were set up by colonial discourse, or uh, you know what is known as U European uh, uh, enlightenment. But with, with, with globalization, new ideas of cooperation come up. So from East-West binary, Orient-Occident binary, we moved on to North-South binary. By and large, we have seen from the 1990s onwards, you know, uh, the Third World, etc. These are these terms were no longer used, and we talked about uh, global South. A global South, by and large, is uh, when we say South, we usually talk about Chennai and so on. But South is a global South that you know Southern Hemisphere is what we are talking about and a large number of you know it's a metaphor it's not that all the countries in southern uh, hemisphere are poor it's about and this is something that we did in 2005 we organized a conference and i edited a book you know i came up with a book called southern post-colonialisms so post-colonial uh, theory moves on to a new dimension south uh, southern post-colonialisms, which is uh, so, uh, uh, South Africa or Africa in general and uh, South Asia and so on and so forth. And there is a new kind of transaction happening, business transaction. It's not about East and West, but among the Southern nations, nation states, there is a lot of collaboration. One of the examples are the SARC countries, S-A-A-R-C, SARC countries. So there's a lot of cooperation, business cooperation. We are trying to help each other. But from that on, over the last 10 years or so, there is a further shift and we are talking about transnationalism, hybridity and 
one and so forth. So, um, post-colonial theory has uh, traveled from one form of extremism to a period of reconciliation and reaching out to each other. And in these times of COVID, you can clearly see how there is so much of cooperation between nations. Of course, once in a while, um, Trump <laughs> fires China and, you know, uh, India fires Pakistan and, and, you know, this is going on. But by and large, I think every country is trying to help every other country. Uh, so these are the changes uh, when, I, you know, the, the title of my talk webinar today is uh, post-colonial theory now. So when I mentioned that now, I uh, wanted us to not uh, remain fixated in the 1980s and 1990s in an adversarial discourse, East versus West, but go on moving, take the reality of globalization into account and we have to uh, reorient post-colonial studies in a different way. And the last point I make now is that uh, somebody wrote something called uh, Neil Lazarus, I think, uh, talked about the politics of post-colonial theory where uh, only a handful of books and thinkers are picked. And then we talk about um, um, post-colonial theory. He said, why? Why are we picking on only these few? One of the reasons is that we always depended on books, printed books. But now a large number of uh, archives have been generated. So when we think about post-colonial colonial condition, we can go out of the uh, print form of um, books and uh, um, printed um, and, uh, and move on to say oral uh, traditions as well. And all this is available on uh, different websites, a large number of archives. So the way to go now in post-colonial studies is to follow digital humanities, what we call digital humanities, that is computational humanities. So whatever we are doing uh, was more dependent on emotion, whether it is literature or history, a lot of emotion was involved. Now, literary studies, historical studies, and uh, like economics and other areas of research, even environmental studies, uh, we have a concept of um, uh, what is known as uh, um, Anthropocene, you know, Anthropocene, all these uh, can really be um, understood much better and we can enlarge the scope of our uh, research field uh, uh, by uh, combining post-colonial studies with digital humanities and calling it post-colonial digital studies etc etc so um, that's all thank you very much i hope uh, i have uh, yeah just 45 minutes thank you uh, thank you so much, Professor Satpati. That was a truly fascinating uh, expose with tremendous, you know, contextualization, historical contextualization of both the beginnings of colonialism and also uh, what, how we can historically contextualize post-colonialism. And I particularly found interesting what you said towards the end that uh, the kinds of boundaries that post-colonialism has been familiar with that they are dissolving, you know, with the diaspora and with the identities, both national and individual are becoming more and more fluid. And that post-colonial theory has to address this new emergence of a, of a if you like, a global self that is happening today. Um, and certainly the digital world is, uh, propelling us towards this, in a sense, dislocation of, you know, physical spaces, because you can access uh, knowledge through the digital world anywhere you are. Um, there, so, so thank you very much for that, that, that wonderful talk. There are a few questions. One I thought I'd perhaps begin with, since you talked about hybridity towards the end of your talk, uh, there's a question from, uh, that concerns hybridity and says the concept of hybridity, uh, can it be used to analyze or to understand the colonizer 
and not just the colonized. This is from a student. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, it's wrong to, and this is something that many thinkers have pointed out, it's wrong to imagine that uh, the whole process is one way. That is, uh, uh, it's not that the colonized is um, influenced or prevailed upon by the colonizer. It's the other way around as well. Many, uh, there have been instances of the colonizer being uh, influenced by uh, the ideas or, or uh, the cultures of uh, uh, those who are colonized. Uh, so, uh, you know, the end result is that, you know, the hybridity is not limited to the colonized uh, subject, but also to the colonizing subject as well. Though, as a um, uh, um, uh, members of the uh, subaltern studies group or uh, uh, post-colonial studies uh, uh, academia, uh, we tend to concentrate on our subject of analysis more often than not is the colonized subject and how hybridity works on, uh, you know, these um, um, different identities, how it's not one identity, it's not uh, a homogeneous identity, but a, a hybrid identity. And that is something that uh, we get from French Fanon's, you know, black skin, white mask. Uh, mimicry leads to hybrid. And of course, uh, Homi Bhava is the one who has um, uh, made things very clear for us, you know, what we understand by hybridity. So I would uh, strongly recommend you to, to go back and uh, read a bit of uh, Hano as well as uh, Homi Bhava. There's another question regarding uh, African writer, Nigerian author, Chinua Achebe. Yes. Uh, and the person who's asked this question would like to know what your view is in terms of his writing and post-colonial theory. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, Chinua Achebe uh, and Gugi Wat Hyongo was uh, were uh, engaged in a debate, not directly but indirectly. Uh, Gugi Wat Hyongo, who began by writing in English, uh, shifted to his own language, which is GQ, whereas Chinua Chibi thought that he could continue to write in English. So uh, what he thought was that, um, like Caliban figure in The Tempest, in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, Caliban becomes a metaphor for, and Caliban says, you have taught me your language and I've learned your language to curse you. So Chinua Achibi uh, thinks that, you know, uh, can use the language of the colonizer to, to actually uh, uh, return the gaze and uh, talk back. Whereas his uh, way of handling English language is very different. If we are talking about hybridity in, uh, you know, individual psyche, uh, there is a kind of linguistic hybridity where he uses a large number of his native um, uh, proverbs, you know, idioms and translates them into English and uses them deliberately making them sound awkward. But that is his way of uh, writing back to the empire. Whereas um, Gugi Wat Hyongo says, okay, I will write in my own language. If you can't read it, it's all right. Now, I happened to meet uh, Gugi Wat Hyongo, and it was very strange that someone who had registered the idea of writing uh, in English for so long and ended up translating his works. He realized that he, his work is not getting known because it's not in English. So, uh, I think it was 2007 when he released a book, his own big novel about a dictator, African dictator, uh, which was originally written in his own language, GQ, but he translated it and he got it released. So uh, both these uh, writers, post-colonial writers, Gugi Wat Hyongo and uh, Chinua Achebe, have a different attitude towards um, how to write back to the empire. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are both very great writers. So I personally mm -hmm. admire Chinua Achebe. He is uh, prescribed in all our syllabi across the country and elsewhere. And he, uh, though I did not quite agree with uh, Chinua Achebe when he is very critical of uh, Conrad's uh, portrayal of Africa, calling it uh, heart of darkness. And uh, then Chinua Achebe calls Conrad a bloody racist, um, which is something, you know, 
which post-colonial theories do not quite agree the violence of the language apart from other things. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't yes. know if I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Perfect. There's another question uh, from a student. Uh, she wants to know, uh, you talked about post-colonialism or post-colonial theory and then feminism. Is, is there a relationship? Is feminism the product, so to speak, of post-colonial thought? Um, um, feminism, of course, predates uh, the emergence of post-colonial theory, but both feminism and post-colonial theory have learned from one another. One of the things, uh, you know, see, post-colonial theory, uh, I forgot to mention this, post-colonial theory is not only about European colonization as such, but all forms of dominance, all forms of dominant discourses, all forms of ideology be it patriarchal, be it uh, racist, uh, be it, uh, you know, uh, gender oriented or even caste. See, it's not a coincidence that uh, caste studies uh, in India, especially and globally, I think caste studies have become very important. Uh, rather, you know, they've become part of post-colonial studies. Similarly, gender studies, you know, queer studies and uh, feminist theory in particular. Now, there's a lot of um, debate among feminists. For example, Bell Hooks is one of the feminists uh, who spells her name with a lowercase b and h, Bell Hooks, who talks about hybridity as well and the postmodernity. Now, many fem aggressive feminists uh, think that hybridity the idea of hybridity and uh, postmodernism are somehow taking the venom out of uh, feminist struggle. So feminism um, uh, of various shades uh, have a, a nonetheless a relationship with the post-colonial theory in the sense that uh, the woman is also right back, right, writing back to, I should not only say, the woman say the queer subject is also writing back to patriarchal discourse. At the same time, somebody like Chitalapade Mahanti, who you know became famous on the West, is very critical of you know you look at how post-colonial theory is being used by Chandra Talapade Mahanti against her own feminist brethren that European feminism like uh, Europe, all other European discourse, thinks of uh, a homogeneous humanity, as if there is no uh, difference, there is no alterity. There is no alterity. No. Chandra Talapade Mahanti says that uh, Western feminism also thinks of uh, feminism in the third world, so-called third world. Chandra Talapade Mahanti's work also came out in the 1980s, so we are still talking about the first world and the third world. So in the third world, uh, women are uneducated and therefore they are subjugated. Uh, they, they internalized patriarchal discourses. And so, but she said, no, this, this kind of homogenization of uh, third world women is, is uh, completely um, misplaced. So uh, feminism is not one monolith. Feminism is also about color, about uh, you know, gender and uh, class, you know, we, where, where you are located, or worldism, as, as we call it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, should we take one more question? One of yeah. you more? Yes, please. Uh, towards the end of your talk, you mentioned how globalization you know, breaks down these binaries that post-colonial theory was situated in, East and West, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned hybridity and also transnationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions is directed towards transnationalism and capitalism, which you also mentioned earlier in the context of Lenin, you know, imperialism, for example, uh, mm -hmm. being the highest form of, um, I believe, said capitalism. So the question is, can transnationalism and capitalism coexist in the real world? I think it's a very interesting oh, yes. uh, question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is a fantastic question. Uh, transnationalism and um, globalization. No, oh, capitalism. Capitalism. capitalism, yes. Um, see, uh, here the whole idea of capitalism 
uh, is then not limited to uh, national boundaries you know when capitalism itself is traveling uh, rather the capital is traveling it's like an octopus you know uh, capital is not limited to one nation so uh, capitalism itself is a kind of transnational capital Cap capital is has become transnational it's not the wealth of one nation that is to be uh, uh, that is to be um, augmented but it, it's about uh, strengthening capitalism through transnational transactions mm. i'm not a an economist uh, <laughs> by any stretch of imagination but you know common sense tells me that this is how it works mm. uh, indian investments in gulf countries elsewhere we all know how important it is and how Indian automobiles um, are doing very well in African nations. So Indian capital has penetrated other uh, nations as well. And similarly, China, Chinese capital, and uh, capital, say, uh, Korean capital, Japanese capital, they, they have also been penetrating. And even the most capitalist of all countries, USA, uh, sometimes feels helpless. You know, it, it, it just can't resist the tentacles of, uh, say, capitalism from across uh, the Atlantic. Mm. Mm. So I think uh, we, we could end here. I mean, there are still a few more questions, but we've been, I think we've been on this webinar now for almost one hour. Um, it's been a great talk, extremely astute and uh, erudite. And I'm sure that all our viewers have enjoyed listening to you. It's been such a wide portrayal of, uh, you know, colonial thought on the one hand, the origins of colonialism and post-colonial thought and where it stands now, as you said, which I found absolutely significant and important to say that uh, in the context of globalization and also what you mentioned about COVID-19, which is again breaking down boundaries uh, in many ways, in many respects and perhaps something new, a new configuration, global configuration will emerge after this. We don't know about that. Uh, thank you so much again for this uh, uh, very scholarly erudite analysis and understanding of uh, post-colonial theory. Um, thank all the viewers and uh, we'll be back soon again. We'll let you know about our further programs in the webinar series. And thank you so much again, Professor Sapati, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Professor Malik, and thank all, all the viewers. I, uh, if you have uh, really serious questions to ask and they want me to answer them, you can always send an email. Uh, I think uh, the email ID is available on the website. Uh, yeah. yeah, please email Professor. Very much. It was a pleasure. I have been able to serve you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I really all. enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.